Hey friends, we're back. Our special guest is Rick Hart from Guardian. You know him from the 1987 California metal release, something that we all locked into as teenagers and uh, uh, the uh, songs Marching On and Spiritual Warfare being on that album, as well as the classic seminal album First Watch from 1989 on the record. So Rick, thanks again for being here, buddy. It's a privilege to have you. Let's talk about that 87 uh, compilation. Uh, California Metal released, again, 1987. Guardian at that time was still spelled without the U. And you gave us Marching On, a different rendition from what was on the, uh, the Enigma release in 89, as well as Spiritual Warfare. Um, that was, California Metal was released on Regency Records. Rick, my question about Guardian at this time is, how did that inclusion how did Guardian's inclusion for the California Metal compilation, how did that come about? largely a uh, Bob Beeman project from what I recall. And um, Bob Beeman and I go way back. <laughs> we, um, I first met Bob Beeman when I was in high school and I was with my best friend and his parents and we went to Tustin Calvary Church and um, he was into this backward masking stuff back then. And as I said, I was a little different, a little more assertive back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, so I started questioning Bob. I would stood up, you know, and say, well, you know, he might talk about Van Halen or something. And I remember getting into it with him. Well, and I don't know, I was probably 16 years old, 16, 17. And, I said, so, you know, he might say something about Van Halen and everybody wants some. And I said, well, what is it that they want? I mean, what's the problem with that? You know, and I was just kind of giving him a hard time going back, trying to find out what it was he was trying to convey. And, um, and I felt like he was attacking, you know, my favorite group or whatever. So just being a rebellious teenager. <laughs> so that's how we started together. And, um, in any event, as I got in the group, our paths crossed, and it was like, you're kidding me. You know, you were that kid, you know, in the church, and the, wow. So we got pretty close, and um, uh, we were sort of, you know, crossing paths all the time, and then, um, and we hung out a lot, and so when the California metal thing that he was talking about putting in those days, he was doing a lot of things, and California Metal was one of those things. And so he invited us to be part of that project if we were interested, and we did uh, do it. We said we wanted to do it, and so um, that's how that came about. So then he engaged uh, Dino and John Elefante to uh, run the studio part of that, and so we went down there and knocked it out in a day probably. Um, you know, I listened to it actually last night and, oh, we had a long way to go. <laughs> so I know I did. Uh, wow. That, that said, Rick, and forgive me for interrupting, but, you know, and, and I appreciate what you're saying is, and, you know, I mean, there's always room for improvement no matter who you are, because none of us are the Lord Jesus who he alone is perfect. I just want to say, though, my friend, that, you know, especially marching on, that's what made me a Guardian fan. That very first rendition, that was my first taste of Guardian. Mm -hmm. I heard marching on. And spiritual warfare was great, too. But marching on had this drive and this hook. And that made me a Guardian fan. And that was in 87. And that made wow. me eagerly anticipate guardian and 88 rolls around and i'm like where's this guardian where's guardian and i was super pleased and mike you can hold yours again up if you want but you know i noticed that whenever because i initially had the version that 
that Mike had. I actually bought mine as well at a mall music store, and it was that version. Um, but that included Marching On On there, and I, I was pleased that it was a, a different rendition, but when I saw Marching On on that release, and it's on this one too, the, the uh, 20th anniversary edition. Yeah. But I was super pleased to see it on there because that's <laughs> the song that made me a Guardian fan. So thank Interesting. you. <laughs> it's, it's, well, thank you so much. I, in all fairness, I was giving it a listen last night. I was cringing at my, you know, my drum parts. I was like, oh, jeez. <laughs> but I've always been overly critical anyways with that sort of thing. But, um, but yeah, we had a long way to go at that point. Uh, it was very clear after listening to it. But, you know, we were kids. We gave it our best shot at the time. And um, uh, I can tell you that those tracks, we played them with a passion. Any recording you hear, we never, it was always very serious business for us. It was no laughing and, you know, we, we were all clowns. I mean, we had a good time, but but when it came time to go to work, we were always very serious, very dedicated, and and I understood the gravity, and I know we all did, of what we were doing and took it very seriously. So I'm so blessed that you guys were touched by it back then uh, when, when it was out and, and that it ministered to you because that was the goal. You know, again, we were working full-time jobs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, burning the candle at both ends. So when we did these sort of recordings and projects, we weren't fresh and well-rested and we were on the move and it was just squeezing this in with the other stuff we were doing. And, and I, I suppose it might've been that way for everybody that was doing it, but, but I'm just speaking for us, but so glad that it touched you guys. And, and so, um, Rick, we always gave it our best shot. I'd like to then move into actually the, the first watch album and it's a seminal album a classic album in the uh the pantheon of uh a christian metal um bef bridging that gap though between california metal and then first watch in 89 when it was released you guys were signed in 85 and <clears throat> first watch was released in 89 so if you don't mind my asking rick there's a there's a, a four-year gap there why did it why four years from the time that Guardian was signed in 85 until the official release of First Watch? That's a good question. And I think there's been various stories that have circulated about it. Uh, from my perspective, after recently kind of listening back on the work that we did, I think one answer is that I think Enigma really wanted us to be ready in, in, a, in a real way. And so when we got signed, it, it wasn't necessarily a developmental deal. Like I've heard some talk about that was a developmental deal or any of that. I think for, for Enigma, Striper was such a focus for them. And we, you got to remember, those guys were done by Yellow and Black Attack. They, they already had all their people. They were set. We were still looking for a guitar player. We still had the armor. There was a lot of change that needed to take place uh, and for us to get to the place where we were actually, you could put us in, in a, an arena and we were ready for it in a real way. And I think that's the honest answer. Musically, uh, by the time First Watch came out, we could hang with the, the best of them. We were ready. We were battle hardened. We were paid our dues. We were seasoned. And again, I was, when we recorded that, I was, think I was 23. So uh, the guys 
the other guys in the band were in their late twenties. So I think that's probably the most honest answer. We had to get our guitar player. We did various bits of recording and demos and um, playing all over Southern California <clears throat> and, and building our following. Because when we met with Wes, it was still very early on. We hadn't built our following yet. Uh, you know, we had to build a road crew and, uh, you know, there was this machine that had to come together. We had no management. And by the time First Watch came out, you know, we recorded that in the summer of 88. I frankly think it should have been released in the winter of 88, early 89. I think it was at some point early 89, <clears throat> Striper had played the Universal Amphitheater and we were supposed to open up for them. But because our record hadn't been released yet, um, Mass opened up for them, which is the band that Mike did. And I always regret that. I feel that really would have kick-started everything for us. Uh, but they waited a few months and released it. And then we, we went on tour the rest of that year off and on. And um, all over the U.S. and Canada. So I think that's probably the most honest answer. I think we could have done material and they could have put it out. You know, I wish we could have put a couple more records out by that time or at least one. I think it would have been good to do that. But I feel confident in saying that by the time First Watch was released and we were sort of out there with the LA Guns and, and, and Warrant and, and Poison and Rat, and all, we could hold our own by that point. And, and that really to me is what counts, you know? And unfortunately it took a few years with all the various factors involved um, for it to come together. Uh, you know, it's like first Mike and Oz were going to produce the record. Then it was decided that it's not a good idea for both of them to do it. We need to have one person solely dedicated to it. And then there's that whole thing that took place. And so then it was Mike's going to do mass. Oz is going to do us. I was really glad Oz was going to uh, produce us. Um, and Oz really, uh, he put a lot into it. So well, that, I, I'm, gl I'm glad we waited on one hand. I wish we could have done more. We were quite busy, <laughs> mind you. We were quite busy. But I wish we could have put out at least one more before that record. But That's a, you, you hit two things, actually, Rick. And one of them is the segue into Oz and his production of First Watch. I'd like to get into that here here uh, in just a second. You mentioned something else too. Uh, quick question. On average, what was your following at this time during the first watch stage? On average fan base, what would you what would you say per night at a at a show? Well, by that point we were selling out the clubs in Hollywood. So right. you know, if we played the Roxy, we'd sell it out. If we did the whiskey, we'd you know, we'd pack it. If right. we played the waters, we'd pack it, you know. So we were to that point where we were invited to uh, uh, events where they'd have various Hollywood bands at the palace or whatever, uh, and, and um, whatever they call those things, band competitions or what, whatever those were. And, you know, the guys in Wasp would show up. I remember hanging out with L.A. Guns and... We were locals in, in Hollywood by that point. We were always there. I remember standing on the street with the guys at Extreme and chatting and they handed us their their EP album. And, you know, it was we were in the thick of it with all of these guys and Faster Pussycat and, you know, Poison and all that stuff. And so, um, you know, we were a top drawing band in, in Hollywood. And, you know, the old saying, and the whole thing was there. Once you make it here, 
you're ready for the globe. You know, you're ready to go out and do it. And that's the proving ground. So by that point, we were very comfortable and, and uh, filling the clubs and, and the shows that we were doing, churches, we'd play large churches and, the, you know, we'd, we'd get a good turnout. And so we spent a few years building our following, paying our dues. And by that point, we were ready to do it, you know, very comfortable with it. So first watch, you guys are selling out on the strip and everything and, and the places you're playing, uh, the Roxy and such. Oz produced first watch and you mentioned how that came about. It was decided that Mike would go with Mass and uh, Oz with you guys. So uh, Rick, if you don't mind, the studio interaction between Oz and you all, any any specific memories with that interaction? And was Oz the kind who produced, who really rolled up the sleeves and got in there? Or was he more laid back and just kind of asked something merited his, his thoughts? Um, Oz was very involved. Um, can't say enough about that. And his kindness and his generosity, it meant the world to me. And I know it meant everything to the other guys, too. Um, he was involved in every aspect. Um, he was driving out from his house in Rancho Cucamonga several nights a week to our studio in Santa Ana. And I remember the first night he showed up with the click track and the, all the gear. And it was like um, boot camp. And... That, that click track, smack, 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 and the, yes. the monitors just, okay, go. You know, and it was like he was a drill sergeant. And, um, and we, we'd do that all night until, you know, 1 a.m., 1.30 in the morning. And then we'd go out to uh, this place that was down the street that was still open, and we'd get soup or whatever, and he'd always buy dinner. And, um, you know... And, and, and we just took the songs apart, everything, every beat, every fill, every guitar lick, everything, and, and really dissected them and uh, move things around, move some beats around, uh, you know, coming up with different beginnings for songs. I think you'll notice there's a lot uh, or several at least of uh, intros with drums um kingdom of rock man <laughs> yeah yeah that was That's i will cool. tell you that was a tricky one it, it it's it's um i always there's a lot of you know it's interesting when as a drummer when you listen to the record it sounds pretty straightforward and then try until you try and sit down and do it uh and and neil pert being my drum mentor uh there's a lot of stuff in there that was just, let's say, not easy for me to pull off uh, at that time in my life. So, yeah, the Kingdom of Rock is actually pretty straightforward beginning. But actually, if you sit down and you try and do it and then throw the triplets in at the end and then start the song, uh, you're on the seat of your pants as a drummer. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, so I did some things in there that... Um, uh, because of the way that we recorded that with the gates on the drums, I think, unfortunately, we lost some of the subtleties and the things that I was doing from a drum perspective. There were nuances and, and snare work and little ghost notes and things. Are, there was stuff I was doing. You don't even hear it. It's not even there. Mm. And I'm so glad that they did re-releases because the, the most recent one, and I forget who put it out, forgive me, but whoever put that out, I have the CD. Was it was it this one retroactive? Or is it one? No, after there's this? one after that. Okay. The one after that is the best I've heard. Can you the detect low, Yeah, the low end has finally been brought up. Yeah. And so when you really, I want to see if you can locate it. You put that on. 
you definitely get more of a sense of how it was in the room for David and I in the studio. You could really hear more of the low end nuances and the groove. Dave and I had a lot of groove then, but I feel like some of that was lost on that record when it was mastered. Very high end, very mm -hmm. tinny, not a lot of low. But Dave and I had this really great groove that just kind of got lost, um, unfortunately. But you had to be there in, in the studio when it was being done to really hear it, it had a lot more energy, I think, uh, and low end groove to it than what you guys ended up hearing on the CD. But in any event, let me ask you about that, Rick. And I'm actually glad that you brought that up. Um, number one, you are telling me then that the newest rendition, the newest uh, uh, care that's been given to this great album which I know it's not this one now. There's one after this one. You are telling me that a lot of those nuances, you as the drummer, you can hear some of those things brought back into it that were there? Yeah, the, the low end groove primarily. Uh, the, the, some of the stuff that I was doing is just not even on there because the gates okay. kind of just clipped it all out, unfortunately. But um, even the symbols, if you, if you listen, you don't even really hear the hi-hats keeping the tempo. Okay. You hear the snare and the bass drum, but you don't really hear those. And and that's that whole gate thing that was, you know, going on when we did it. Then let me ask this. Uh, I, two, two questions staying right here real quick. Number one, does David Bach maybe? Um, I don't know if David was kind of the overseer of, of your all's material meaning keeping, keeping the archives together. Do you, like David or somebody from the Guardian camp, have the master, the master I, recording? I believe so. I would have to ask David. He and I have talked recently um, as well as, well, the three of us have. Paul, David, and I have talked um, live on the phone recently. Okay. Um, and um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if he's got it or if Oz has it or Tony has it, uh, but somebody's got it there. Because if you guys have that master, that stuff is still on there and it could simply be from the master recording, your nuances should be on the master recording, right? Yes, perhaps. Correct. So my goodness, brother, what about like a all somebody would need to do would get that master and let's let's have another re-release and maybe a different mix and you know oh, with the boy, nuances I'd love there. that. <laughs> I, I'd love that. That'd be great. I, I think you might have three guys standing in line right here to make that purchase <laughs> of that <laughs> I, new I, master. I, I, I would. I'd I'd love to hear the tracks individually. Um, getting back to Oz, um, you know, he was a perfectionist. Okay. And um, I can say that, you know, speaking from my perspective, the drum tracks, if it wasn't a, you know, in those days you couldn't cut in anything. You turn it on, as we used to say, the tape don't lie. It's either right or it's wrong. So I would do a cut and Oz would listen to it, do it again, and then do it again. <laughs> so until the, the, the track, at least from my perspective, when I did my tracks at Sound City, um, each track had to be perfect before he went to the next song. No, meaning no mistakes. Not, everything had to be on the click. Everything had to be absolutely perfect or he would say, do it again. And there were, there were times I wanted it perfect too, but there were times where I'd be listening in the cans and then I'd wait for him to, you know, him and, and then Dan Evans all in the booth who had done the engineering and the work on the, um, in God we trust. 
and Madonna's True Blue record before that. So this guy was knew what he was doing, and they'd be listening, and and I'd just be waiting to hear, am I going to have to do this again, you know, and start over, or did I get it in the in the can, as they used to say, and and it was up to him, and he. No, I think you can do better. <laughs> so it was one more time. So, um, but yeah, he, Oz really poured his heart into that record. He he was with us every step of the way. Uh, he introduced some things that was so new uh, at that time, the DAT tape mm -hmm. and flying background vocals in and all this stuff was new stuff that, that you know, uh, they weren't doing until then um so we we're using some new technologies and we recorded that record all over southern california so we pieced it together uh i did my drum tracks at sound city um dave cut some tracks there we did some stuff there and then we did some stuff at uh pachyderm studios dino studio there we did some stuff at another studio down the way, Los Alamitos. We did some things at Oz's house, Oz's house, and we just pieced it together. So I wasn't always there for every part of the performance. I was there for some of it. And, um, you know, he, he brought everybody in. Brent Jeffers uh, did the keys. Mm -hmm. And Brent was actually in the band when I auditioned. Okay. And some of you guys probably know that the five piece I was talking about included Brent Jeffers. And then he ended up working with Striper and, you know, you know, he's, he, he went on to do it professionally and uh, tour with a lot of people and, and he's incredible. So he did the keys and I'm not even sure where they tracked those. So we were all very busy guys at the time. And again, working full-time jobs. So um, I might've been there for some of the cut cutting of, I, I know I was there for vocals and um, a lot of the work on the record, but, you know, it was done in pieces. And then the guys in Striper would show up. Now, for me, Robert showed up on day one. Uh, Robert Sweet was there day one at Sound City when um, I was setting up the drums. And so he and I sat down, and this is when they were working on In God We Trust, which is my favorite Striper album. And the drums are impeccable on that record. And uh, so that was around the time he was working with that. And so he came down, uh, which in retrospect was quite a drive for him. You know, these guys would get in a car and <laughs> put themselves in a seat and drive for hours sometimes, you know, uh, to their credit. So he and I sat down and um, he would kick it around a little and then I'd kick it around a little bit and tune it here and tune it there. And, you know, uh, so... He, he was definitely supportive and working with me to get the best drum sound that we could. You know, he was by then a seasoned pro and that was my first time. I'd done a lot of recording in various places, but this was my first sort of big studio experience. And um, he was, he was a big help in kind of capturing the initial sound that we were going to go with for the record. And then, um, you know, Tim would show up, um, Mike would show up. Mike lent us his microphone, and I could be wrong. This is how crazy things were in those days. I think his microphone was like a $30,000 microphone, if I'm not mistaken, back in 1988. Yeah, <laughs> so was... I think he lent us his microphone uh, to use for the record, which, you know, um, there's even pictures of uh, David using Tim's bass at Sound City, cutting some of the bass tracks for the record. So all the guys were so uh, helpful and in, in, uh, supportive in us making that record. And they showed up big time for us. But Oz was, um, I can't give him enough credit. He, he, he really extended himself financially and uh, every other way the time yeah it's crazy it's i remember at some point he had to go do the photo session for in god we trust for the record so it's like he goes and he does that he does this whole thing and then he comes back and he's still peeling the stuff off 
as as we're doing whatever it was we were doing and it was just, just crazy you know when you think about it he he was really you know, as soon as the the uh all the production everything was done you know he'd be in a limo with the guys you know, playing in striper playing them uh you know the songs and so he really really was a cheerleader for us and i can't thank him enough for all of his hard work and and putting that together so people like you guys could go into a store and get it back so many years ago and go wow this sounds pretty good you know it's really oz took us you know in summary he took us to the next level he took us to a professional level recording wise I, it might I be think. worth it might be worth mentioning too that um according to oz I, I watched an interview with him recently oh where he stated that he was able to take his guitar playing to another level because of the time he spent with tony um he credits tony with much of um the outstanding guitar work he did on their Against the Law album, yeah. you know, kind of taken him to another level on his guitar playing. So yeah. there, was, there was some reciprocation in that uh, um, that relationship, I would say, you know. It's interesting you mentioned that because, true story, I heard the record and then I called Tony and I said, Tony, tell me the truth. Did you play any at all on that record? <laughs> I said that to him because there was a similarity in the style between Tony and Oz's playing on the record. Uh, and I thought, wow, you know, uh, this is a totally different spin for Striper, mm -hmm. totally different direction for them. And I, of course, digged it very much, but I can hear the Tony influence for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Which I've always loved Tony's playing. Regarding that influence in, you know, no right or wrong here. And Rick, you mentioned in God We Trust being one of your favorite Striper albums. One of my favorite Striper albums is Against the Law. And I think that Oz in particular especially shines on that album regarding his virtuosity. And again, back to your link, Mike, you know, I saw the same interview and, and Oz gives Tony credit for maybe a little bit of tutelage, you know, that shows up on Against the Law. But I absolutely love Against the Law. But I digress, back to Guardian. Um, first watch, I mean, it's, it's a seminal album in the Christian metal community, especially, from my understanding, Rick, 30,000 units sold the first month of release. Um, there's a, uh, a site, it's uh, Angelic Warlord, and it's a uh, pretty much a comprehensive list of Christian rock and metal, especially metal artists. Uh, Guardian First Watch, it ranks number five on their list wow. of the top 50 metal hard rock uh, and metal Christian albums of the 80s. So. Wow. First Watch is at number five on that list, the top-ranked uh, hard rock and metal albums wow. of the 80s. So uh, that's, man, my hat's off to you guys. And I wow. certainly, as an 18-year-old, remember <laughs> when I had that cassette tape in my hand, it spent many hours in my walk, man, with my headphones, you know, just going, going, going. Um, that's so special to hear. Um, I have to tell you that... Um, I wish that somebody could have shown me the future yeah. because I had no idea the impact. Yeah. I had no idea. I was just doing it. You know, I was just doing it, doing God's will, playing. I had no idea uh, that, you know, we'd be talking about this so many years later. I had no idea. I was just doing my thing and, um, and, and talking about Tony's playing. Um, I always thought he was really good. Uh, but, you know, at the time, I didn't realize the level of his playing. We were just being the best we could be. Tony and I worked real hard in terms of our chops. 
uh, as a rule. They were always very important to us and live performance was very important to us. And um, I, uh, he and I just worked real hard together. I never really thought about, wow, you know, what an incredible player. You know, I just thought, oh, you know, we're, we're partners in this, you know. And but it in was listening all now. In, in, in taking nothing away from Tony, because he was certainly a dynamic part of the equation, but really, yeah. it was all you guys, buddy. All you guys brought. I mean, like I said, when you were mentioned, you know, Kingdom of Rock, I mean, it's got that dynamic. I distinctly remember your drumming intro to that. And so, and imagine my elation. I'm, I'm 50 years old, and I was 18 when I first laid ears on First Watch. So imagine my elation in getting to speak with you today. Never would I have imagined, hey, one of my one of my heroes, you know, from a, a hero from a band, you know, the classic Guardian. I mean, it's you, you know, you and Tony oh, and David and Paul you. and all you guys brought it. And uh, I was, I was, you know, at that time, I mean, Christian metal wasn't new, but it was still burgeoning in 89. Yeah, yeah. And I was proud to hold that album up and say, hey, this is a band that I, I love absolutely, not just musically, but also with a great message. But, you know, you had to have that music to make it qualify amongst your peers, right? I sure. Mean, so sure. I was proud of that Guardian album. <laughs> that is, that's so, so neat to hear. Um, I think one of the things that happened was when I left and then Paul left, you know, within that month, um, which was, as I've stated before, you know, and posts on Facebook, uh, a critical error uh, in doing so. And I've regretted it ever since. Why did you leave, Rick, if I may ask, since we're at this juncture, if it's okay yeah. to ask? Sure. Um, well, we talked a little bit about my upbringing, uh, and, and I think that ties into it. Um, you know, to be candid, Thankfully, there's a lot of conversation today, very common to hear things about anxiety or panic. In 1989, that was not something that people talked about, but it's something that I started struggling with. And uh, to put it sort of in perspective, um, I was having some real challenges in that area right before tour. And it was probably a combination of a couple of things, reconnecting with my father, uh, just finishing the record. I had just finished the record that, you know, uh, on the go. And so I had a bit of a, a, a bit of a meltdown. And then that kind of segued into these panic attacks and um, not to go off on that, but I can tell you that being on the road uh, was very difficult with the condition. And in those days, we didn't have cell phones and computers and FaceTime and all this stuff. So, uh, you know, you'd have an occasional pay phone or something that you'd put the change in to make a call. Mm -hmm. So um, I had some real difficulty with touring and it was the condition that was wreaking havoc on me. And you'll notice, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, how do you go all that way? And then just when you get the bird off the ground, you leave. Like, but this was all part of it. I was going through a lot of uh, challenges there and touring really magnified it. And so I made the decision because of how difficult touring was and knowing that that's all we'd be doing uh, to leave because it was that painful for me to tour. And, I, and so, so I made that decision to leave. Yeah. If I can, if I can say, Rick, um, I have a daughter who struggles with some pretty extreme anxiety. Um, and I've seen how debilitating it can be for her and her life. I mean, uh, just e even trying to hold down a full-time job can yeah. be extremely difficult for her because of all the things that can 
trigger the anxiety. So yeah. when you say that, I mean, for me anyway, I know firsthand that what you're saying is completely legit. <laughs> So yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I, you know, I was saying I was young and stupid, um, but you know, I was 23, 24 years old, and uh, you know, these these, without going into great detail, the, you know, these these panic attacks and things at the time were uh, pretty rough, and and so from the outside, nobody would know it. But then, you know, and not, not, not just that, but, um, you know, then you'd get the, the flu or, you know, I, I did, I remember doing a show in Boise, Idaho. I had like 103 fever, you know, and that, that's rock and roll. But, uh, you know, when you have that condition, that sort of stuff can just wreak havoc on you. When then you, you're sick and you can't breathe and, and you're drumming. And in those days, I was pretty wild and aggressive on the drums. There was a lot of energy that was, was put out at the shows. And um, I was no court stenographer sitting back there. I was, I was on it, you know, and so all that energy and then, you know, these various factors uh, made it difficult uh, to cope with the touring schedule. And so that's why, that's why I left pretty much in a nutshell that was the primary driver for it. And um, had not those things been the issue, uh, Guardian's destiny would have been completely different because I would have stayed, Paul would have stayed, I'm quite sure. Uh, and we would have gone on to do the second record and the third and the fourth and so on. And I think the band would have clearly taken it a completely different path uh, than the one they took, uh, you know. But it is what it is, unfortunately. But that's that's kind of why I disappeared, and um, and I think one of the things that happened was once the other guys got in the band, there wasn't a lot of talk about. The, the history of the band. It was kind of like them going forward was the band. And what I find interesting is, and I think this, at least for me as a drummer, this is a good example. Um, you take Rush and you take their, their original drummer who just did the one record, uh, but launched them, did, you know, sort of the touring, uh, you know, the, the shows and the stuff and did the record. And, and then you have Neil Peart, in my opinion, the best rock drummer that ever lived. Uh, my opinion, anyways. Um, well, he's always in the top three. They always give it to John Bonham, but, you know, I, say, well, I like John Bonham, too. But, you know, I would pick Neil. And in any event, you take Neil and, and you... The other drummer still brought up 40 years later. They still use the logo from the first record. They still play songs from the first record John live. John was his name, the first one. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So they still held on to that history. And any piece of Rush that you see, video, what, they talk about him or they talk about the history or, you know, he had some struggles. So they had to addition another play, you know, but it was all part of their history. Mm -hmm. And and I have I have felt you know at different times that you know uh, un unfortunately that history in Guardian vanished and there really isn't you know the the connection of you know you know from the beginning to 1990 and you got to remember the whole thing was Paul's concept the lyrics were Paul's lyrics. A lot of the songs were Paul's songs. So you've got all that. And then instantly it's kind of, where'd that go? I, I frankly think that, you know, it's important to embrace the, the beginnings of a, a band and their history uh, and, and include that in, in everything. And, and that's just my opinion. 
and I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I well, think ha had that been done, it, it would have maybe eliminated a lot of the questions that people may have had yeah. in down the line, you know. I was going to say, I think the fans do, you know, um, whether or not the band itself did, maybe another issue, but I think the fans do, you know, the, the, especially the fans who been there since that first album you know they haven't forgotten the history so yeah um, for what that's worth you know yeah well it's obviously it's it's so important to me yeah. i i poured my heart out uh into that band and i know paul did too um until i left and um being the extreme person that I am, it's kind of like either full throttle or, or n nothing at all. And that's kind of how I was with the group. It was full throttle, you know, and it, it ties into, you know, I didn't go with them to Japan like I should have because I was suffering with this thing. And, and you know, uh, so it kind of ended abruptly and unfortunately, and as it's funny how God shows you things, right? Uh, you know, God was doing so so many powerful things that I was unaware of. Like I said, I, I wish I had known because I would have toughed it out. I would have mm -hmm. found a way. But you know, at at that time, you don't know. You just move on with your life, and you know. Uh, to this day, I'm, you know, I've I mentioned Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots. You know, I've had long conversations with him on the phone. And, um, you know, I mean, if, if, if history had been a little different, I could have been the drummer for Stone Temple Pilots, you know, <laughs> because Dean and I were hanging out and we had a lot of similar musical interest. And, and he would go to the studio and I'd bang on the drums. But, you know, and I, and I said to him, you know, I, I, Given my history, I feel like I've seen so many documentaries where these, you know, whether it's Elton John or it's this or that or whoever, you know, and they sit down and I, I have a very similar story line in terms of the beginnings of these players and how they made music their life. It was kind of all they had. So, you know, I still to this day find it interesting that I didn't pursue that path because I felt like that's kind of what I was destined to do. And I just sort of ejected and unplugged and being the extreme person I did, I didn't, I didn't dabble at all. It was either do it for real or don't do it at all. And it wasn't many years until I picked up the sticks again and, you know, started playing and, and, you know, Paul and I eventually did some work together. And was that guardian one, Rick? Yeah. So let's talk about Guardian One. That was a few years back, and then yeah. you, you and Paul recorded what was it, a three-song EP? Yeah. Okay. And is there a place that for those, uh, what formats, what all formats is Guardian One available? In? Is it is there a way that fans can get in, get a hold of some of that material from you guys? Oh sure, yeah. Just go on Spotify, or it's on it's iTunes one. also. Yeah. 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 It's on what, Rex? You kind of cut out. It's on iTunes also. Okay. You can download it there still. Yeah, so, I, I was just listening to it today on Amazon. So it's it's out there. Okay. Uh, Rick, is there, what's, if I may ask, is, is there, uh, do you and, and David and Tony and Paul, which I, I believe you and Paul do, but What's the what's the temperature between you and you and David and uh and, and Tony and, and Paul? Is there is there any chance of you guys maybe uh doing something together again? Uh, it's a good question. Um, initially, when Paul and I started working together again, uh, we had conversations with David and and Tony 
um, multiple conversations. And <clears throat> what you guys hear was just demo work that Paul and I tossed together uh, in, in my little studio room at my house. And um, they were scratch tracks, essentially, of melodic ideas that we had for songs. And what ended up happening was um, David and Tony decided uh, to go ahead and just do something with the current lineup that they were in. And, and I think part of that might have just been because they didn't want to, at least, I won't speak for them. Um, I had a great conversation with Tony, and it was good to talk to him. And he had mentioned he liked hearing the, you know, that was playing again. And um, he liked what he heard. He liked the material. Uh, but he just wanted to go forward and not backward from what I recall him talking about. So they decided that they would just go ahead and do something with the other guys. As much as Paul and I wanted to do the work with them, and I feel like maybe David was conflicted, understandably. They spent a lot of years with those guys and to just kind of turn the back and go back to, you know, the original guys, there could be some conflict there. And so it didn't, it didn't happen. So Paul and I decided to just sort of mix it up together. And then Ron Campbell uh, really liked what he heard and was saying, you know, this is the old guardians back, you know, the old sound is back. This is so great. Uh, and so he, he helped us on the marketing and packaging side and, and merchandising and all that. And, but we literally, this was a work of God because Paul didn't even have a guitar. I did my tracks, you know, as you can see behind me on, you know, rubber cymbals <laughs> yeah. and V drums. And they were just scratch tracks. They were just laying down sections of the song and they pieced them together so there's really no fills there's really you know like i said rubber symbols so um we felt like we had at least invested that much that that somebody might have an interest in hearing it so we put it out there i ordinarily would have never wanted to release product that was so unfinished in probably 30 percent of what it was supposed to be but we didn't have any more resources or time at that point in time to do any more. So we just stuck it out there and said, well, hope you guys like it. You know, we just pieced it together and uh, it is what it is. It doesn't have, it's, I call it a skeleton version because there are so many tracks that aren't even there that we heard in our mind that we wanted to put on there and it never, it never materialized. And then fast forward, uh, David, uh, Paul, and I uh, spoke more recently, and um, we did have a conversation about doing some work together. And we were going to, it was going to be, uh, as David put it, fusion rides again. And we were going to go back to our roots with uh, the whole space concept and all that fun stuff. And... Um, I sent them a, a whole bunch of songs and material and music. So we got pretty far down the road with that. Um, but that sort of fizzled with the pandemic and the political issues and all the stuff going on uh, and some various other things that sort of came into play uh, that it just... Uh, the timing wasn't there but we started the process and it it's um it's still a very good possibility uh you know i mean to give you an idea you know the the end of last year we were 
pretty set on releasing something in 2021, a full record. I mean, <laughs> we've done the work. Uh, we so pa you have Paul is recorded pieces of it. Yeah, pieces. You and Paul and David. Well, stuff that I've done, I've sent to them. Okay. And it's all the part because I play all the parts. Okay. The bass, the guitar, the I'll have to send you a little flavor of, of so you can hear what it is that we were going to do. But, um, uh, you know, Paul netted out the whole concept. This was going to be in the beginning. We're going to do a whole half side like a Rush 2112 thing. Nice. With a whole story and it being, and Paul can elaborate, but it being the sort of uh, the beginning uh, when God created everything and, and going in, in from there. Uh, so it was going to be big in scope, lots of space, lots of keys, lots of fills, lots of stuff that we all like. And, um, and then the second side was going to be various songs uh, that had all sorts of different um, influences uh, from my background and their backgrounds of things we like. But so we got pretty far down the road on it. And then it just sort of stalled out. And I think, um, you know, if uh, God pulls it all together, we'll eventually reconvene when the timing is right. And, and frankly, um, I think we just probably need some help uh, in, in people out there pitching in with their skills to help us pull it together. Because I'm not a techie guy, um, and I can't speak for the other guys, but uh, Paul doesn't have the means to, to but, you know, we got, uh, for example, if, if let's say we're going to do the whole thing or some of it on GarageBand. Because for me, I, I can do pretty well on GarageBand. So I'll put all these tracks on GarageBand. And then if we had an individual that could compile all of that and put it together and connect the dots, we'd have it, but we just need those resources to, uh, to be able to facilitate it. In the meantime, I've thought about hosting to do a virtual band and, you know, enlisting anybody, any player out there, uh, putting a group together of guys to make some songs and do it virtually, fly mm -hmm. everything together and then, you know, some of the stuff that I was working on for Guardian, I would love to see the light of day. And um, I think they're good songs. And I know the other guys liked them a lot. So it'd be great to get sort of a virtual band. And I don't know, I've, I've, I haven't asked him Gaines yet, but I've communicated with him a couple of times. I would love for him to play on a, a couple of tunes. Uh, I know he and I like the old 70s stuff and the 60s stuff. I'd love to do a cover of a, a couple of 60s songs and have him play the bass on it. So You know, Rick, uh, Tim, I know that Tim is a big Elton John fan such as yourself. And what, what about Kenny Metcalf? Because Kenny, you know, on a different podcast that, that, that Rex and I had done, Kenny was one of our guests and a uh, I think he has like a virtual studio at his house. Is that what, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just wow. saying from the hip here. Yeah. Are, are you, are you connected with Kenny? Not at all. That's what I need. I need connections. I need, it, it's, <laughs> you know, it's interesting um, how, how God works. It's like, it's like I'm living a different life. There was a time where God lined, you know, you talk about buying the CD, but I, I could tell you stories that would make your head spin. I mean, the stuff that God did in those days is, is mind blowing. When I think about my life today, as I sit here to think of some of the stuff that God put together is unbelievable. It's just, you know, if you tell somebody today, they don't even get it. It just goes in one ear out the other. You had to be there, but um, God did some unbelievable stuff in, in the eighties in my life and those around me and brought resources out of thin air. People just came. It was like he brought people. And um, 
I always feel like if he wants me to, if God wants me to work again for him, he's going to do the same thing because it's kind of what I'm used to. You know, he'll bring the people. Somehow it'll come together and I'll be able to work for him again if, if, if it's his will. You know, otherwise I won't work. I won't do it. I want, you know, it's, it's a waste of time. If I can say, Rick, um, as I was listening to the Guardian 1 EP today, I was particularly struck by the song, What God Can Do. That's yeah. a great song. I like it, and isn't it? I like it. I, 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 sat, I, I listened to it once and then I listened to it again. It, it, um, it's just a really good song. And, um, of course, it speaks to exactly what you're talking about. Um, True. True. But, uh, you know, I'd love to see that, see the light of day, maybe again, if you did some kind of project, but yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, Paul and I t talked extensively about re-releasing those songs yeah. and doing them the right way. You know, speaking of that song, that whole section where you hear sort of like a church organ and some voices in the background, sort of choir-like. We envision this huge pipe organ thing with choir and, and Beach Boy level sort of uh, tambourine sort of thing shaking in there and uh, sort of a Beach Boy massive wall of voices. And it's 5% it's of what we heard in our mind, just that little section there, you know. Yeah. So... Maybe one day. I would love to do it right. I think they're good songs. Rick, we'll post, uh, is there any specific contact link that you might like for people to, to see in the description if they can, can help you guys out? Or I know that you're on Facebook, so people, you can look Rick Hart up on Facebook. Is there yeah. any other connection, public connection? I would say just message me on Facebook Okay. Um, with your contact info and and i will get in touch okay and sounds great rick it's been our honor and our privilege to have you thank you brother and you honestly you. touched us <laughs> yeah thank um, you you know 32 years ago, when we first heard this closing out guys a quick uh, quick script scripture reference we like to do that um you know and rick you were kind of talking about some things there but uh, psalm 121 two through four uh, it just says that my help comes from Adonai, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. Your guardian is not asleep. No, the guardian of Israel never slumbers or sleeps. So that's Psalm 121, 2 through 4. And uh, guardian just reminded me of that verse of scripture, about the Lord being our guardian. So, uh, Friends, thank you for watching Area 312. It's been our privilege to have Mr. Rick Hart from Guardian. Thanks again, Rick, and stick around. And, and uh, But we'll sign off to our viewers out there. Thank you, friends. Thanks, you guys. Uh,